And it is Wednesday, June 28th. I wish to call to order this work session of the Monroe County Board of Commissioners. And because of the switch, I'd like to ask um, Ms. Whitmer to come up and talk to us about the um, proposal for upgrading one or two fields at, Mon at Cars Farm Park with um, synthetic turf. And I see you brought your whole entourage with you today. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you for having us. So would you speak really loudly because the acoustics in here are terrible. I will have a, my coach's voice. How's that? <laughs> there you go. All righty. Uh, my name is Kelly Whitmer. I'm the director of Monroe County Parks and Recreation. I did invite guests here today, and I will introduce them. They do want to speak on this topic. And they can answer questions in their specific areas. Um, so I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes. And you stop me if you want to ask a question. If not, you can, we can ask questions at the end. And I want to tell you that I'm here to discuss the Karst Athletic Complex and the BRCJ Athletic Field Improvement Plan. And BRCJ stands for Bledsoe, Rigger, Cooper, James Engineering. All park facilities have a finite lifespan and capital improvements are required over time to assure safety and modernization for every facility. You don't see teeter-totters in playgrounds anymore. There's a reason. <laughs> Um, the Parks Board is requesting that if the commissioners and the council, they want their request is to invest in improvements at the Cars Athletic Complex. A couple of funding options are the food and beverage tax, general obligation bonds, or other funding options that you may have available for capital improvements. And let me give you some background on the complex. It's approximately 33 years old and it is showing its age. With assistance of BRCJ Engineering, the Park Board has chosen a project priority list out of their plan that they have been given. The top priority is one to two synthetic turf fields with LED lights. Now keep in mind, yes, we understand they're expensive, that two LED systems and two turf fields would be transformative for the complex. One's great, two's better. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Synthetic turf fields have a positive impact on the community by increased field playability, increased tourism opportunities. For example, a two-day tournament, a mid-sized to, to bigger than mid-sized tournament may have an local economic impact of over $600,000. I'll let that sink in for, for a second. And I have Visit Bloomington here and they can discuss more about numbers and what they believe. It is possible to construct two synthetic fields with LED lights in the summer of 2024. The day after construction is done, we could start playing. Now, if a drainage or irrigation project is chosen, before synthetic fields are installed, the remaining grass fields, I want you to think about this, the remaining grass fields will sustain greater damage because those two fields that are out for drainage and irrigation repairs will take 14 to 18 months to get back in rotated play. This will also mean that fields that needed to be rotated out cannot be rotated rotated out and have to remain in play, which means they will even sustain greater damage. Because once the dirt starts coming and the grass starts to disappear, it gets worse and worse each week. So if we could have synthetic fields in play immediately, that will put less stress on the entire complex. We are almost at capacity or at capacity. It depends how you want to define it. Synthetic turf fields do allow for a longer playing season. This also means increased field rental revenue that we can go longer in the season. They have less yearly maintenance costs to, re to reduce labor, reduce equipment, and reduce supplies. In 20 years, the yearly maintenance cost for two synthetic fields is approximately $60,000. 
Compare that to $600,000 for two grass fields for 20 years. This does not include the synthetic turf and infield replacement. We'll talk about that later. Synthetic fields use no water. This means no water bill. <laughs> this means no irrigation system maintenance. This is a tremendous amount of money. CBU has been increasing irrigation rates for the last couple of years. And, and it's, it's only gonna get more expensive as we go. Synthetic turf fields have less daily maintenance, which means they use less fuel. This equates to reduced carbon dioxide emissions required to maintain a field. It will reduce the carbon dioxide emissions synthetic fields will. Synthetic turf fields are immediately playable after a rain event, unless maybe it's Hurricane Katrina. That's a different issue. It is also an asset to local families. By allowing families to stay close at home for tournaments, Many families have multiple children in various age groups. Families can save travel time, travel money, and the money stays in Monroe County. If we can have a tournament here instead of Indianapolis or instead of Fort Wayne. It makes for a very long weekend if grandma gets assigned to go to Karst, mom is going to Indianapolis, and dad is in the car going to Columbus. When, if we had a tournament, a particular tournament, they could be here in Monroe County enjoying their day, their family day. So keep that in mind. Um, every family has multiple children usually, so it is a big deal for them. As with any parks facilities, the health and safety of our participants is paramount. So there are a lot of issues to, to consider with synthetic fields and with grass fields. Therefore, serious consideration should be given to natural organic infill. Mr. Knuth is going to probably discuss infills. Natural organic infill also has cooler surface temperatures than crumb rubber infill. Temperature is a concern on athletic fields. Plastic pellets and crumb rubber infill are also a micro pollutant. And I know that's a very big concern for Monroe County residents. A synthetic turf field must pass a G-Max test for shock absorption. What is that? When one falls down, how cushiony is it? It's very similar to a playground surface. If you're falling from a particular height, what is your absorption rate? Another concern is bacterial growth. And, but this is mainly on indoor fields, outdoor fields, are naturally exposed to UV radiation from the sun and grooming redistributes the infill, allowing the sun to reach the exposed areas. So outdoor synthetic fields are much better than indoor synthetic fields controlling bacterial growth. If playing on a synthetic, synthetic field is a concern, cutter staff, park staff, we can produce an athletic schedule that would rotate use or limit use by age groups. So we can make provisions in our schedule to make sure a particular child is not on the synthetic field if there is a concern. The synthetic turf and infield would, will need to be replaced every 10 years. We can start a savings account, non-reverting account, to bank funds to go toward the replacement of these items. We can charge a capital development fee, similar to what the YMCA does, to synthetic turf users. We can solicit donors, sponsors, and field naming rights. But I will not promise that we'll have 100% of the funds to replace the infill in the surface in 10 years, but it will be a respectable amount. We all anticipate discussing this issue with the Monroe County Council on July 11th. Now I would like to ask Mr. Malone <laughs> to come on up. He is the director of Cutter Soccer, and I think he wants to say a few words on the issue. Thank you for having me here today. I am Louis Malone, the executive director of Cutter Soccer Club. Um, we are here to support 
the Parks Department in their request um, and the Parks Board in their request from the engineers in terms of what the priority is. Um, turf fields are exceptional. I could talk about it from a community standpoint, community soccer standpoint, or a travel soccer standpoint. But on all accounts, it, this is where our community needs to be moving. Um, from a community standpoint, we lost last spring, this past spring was wonderful, <laughs> but the previous spring we lost um, well over what was standard based on major rain events. And those major rain events meant that our kids didn't get to play. As a club that focuses on positive youth development through sport, that's really difficult for us. We did have to go back to the parks department and talk about a way to alleviate that, uh, that, that expense that was incurred, and they were wonderful with us. Being able to utilize the fields more routinely is beneficial for us. And having the um, turf fields being able to be used immediately after a rain would be exceptional, exceptional. Um, there would be multiple lines, we could move things around. It just gives us that utility. On the travel side, we have not had, um, well, there are two things. We can talk about performance and we can talk about opportunity. Opportunity to play games in Bloomington. We routinely have to move games because the fields, as I won't talk about the condition of the fields. I think Kelly already addressed that, but they are pretty, they, they need maintenance. Um, we routinely have to go elsewhere if there's a rain event. Um, we have issues uh, in, in a variety of ways in terms of training on these in these environments where there are divots or mud puddles or whatever the case may be. Bottom line, all of this needs to be renovated. Doing the turf fields first allows for us to maintain our training environment. We did sign on a new contract for multiple years, longer than we've ever done before, while those other renovations take place. It means that we have better training environments, which makes our local players and families happier <laughs> to stay local as opposed to driving that highways right there and it's not very far up to Indianapolis. We want to make sure that we are providing the best opportunities for them to train here locally, in part because we believe we do things a little bit differently, but also because no one needs to be in the car that much. No 12 year old needs to drive three hours round trip to go play soccer. They should be able to do it here and we'd love for your support to do that. Um, in terms of the development of our actual players, for those who really care about the sport, um, turf allows kids to develop at a different rate and when they, because their touch has to be so good. And we can talk about that and things like that. Um, but the, our kids then have to go play on turf elsewhere, which puts them at a competitive disadvantage from time to time. It's not the most important part for me, but I do want to at least acknowledge that on a player performance side, as well as from the kid uh, on a community side, this is a win-win-win all the way around. Um, we do support the natural infill. There are lots of concerns from our board about the rubber. <laughs> um, we wanted to talk about that, which is why we originally did talk with Kelly. Uh, um, I did mention to Kelly that we would already plan on having the really little kids, if it did end up being rubber, moved off of those fields, working in the natural spaces, because, you know, natural's better, at least in my opinion. Um, and so, and so these are kinds of things that we want to consider. I don't want to take too much of your time. I do want to say that we support all the renovations that are being offered here. Turf is, allows us the opportunity to do things better across the board. Um, and we really appreciate you allowing us to use the fields as we have been able to do so. As a nonprofit organization, uh, so far, last year we gave out over $50,000 in scholarships. This year I've already given out over $40,000 in scholarships as we're looking at moving into the travel, the travel season. We want our money devoted to providing kids opportunities and not buying land. <laughs> and, and so if we can continue to have a really healthy relationship with our parks department and the Monroe County government, then that means our efforts can go where they need to be toward providing great experiences for the kids growing up in Monroe County. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And I am happy to, or Kelly, did you want me to answer questions now? Or? Okay, I'm happy to answer any questions there. We can move to the next person. Questions? I'll hold my questions. We may call you back up here, although I understand that you played soccer yourself uh, for many, many years also. I did. I played, uh, I played at Hanover College. Uh, that's where I kind of ended my, my days. Uh, but yeah, I played on the north side of Indianapolis at Dynamo and things like that. So soccer has been a major part of my life. And as you know, youth work has been a major part of my life. I worked here yeah. at Youth Services Bureau. So um, being here in, in this role kind of combines my two passions. Focusing on the right side of sport and how it helps kids develop, while also, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about it. So I just get to be around soccer all the time. 
It's so good to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It feels so comfortable. I'm just like, oh, I'm going back. I was like, oh, no, I remember this place. It's pretty comfortable, yeah. Thank you so much. We also have, we also have uh, Mike McAfee and Pete Nelson from Visit Bloomington. Good morning, commissioners. Um, my name is Mike McAfee. I'm the executive director at Visit Bloomington. Thanks so much for your um, consideration of, of this important project. Um, this is something that uh, Visit Bloomington has been um, involved in advocating for for, for you know, in, since I've been here for 15 years, so, so longer than that. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the importance of sports um, and tourism here in the Monroe County area, and then. Um, Pete Nelson is our um, sports development director. One, one branch of Visit Bloomington is the Hoosier Sports Corporation. Um, it's a basically a fancy marketing term for our sports sales and marketing wing. Um, it gets our foot in the door in a lot of places. So he'll talk a little bit more about specifically um, some events and things that we could, this opportunity could, could lead us to. But um, I just wanna say, you know, as far as Visit Bloomington is concerned, we, we promote the Monroe County region, um, tourism in this region for leisure, conferences, and sports, like I talked about the Hoosier Sports Corporation. Um, worldwide sports tourism generates about $560 billion in expenditures a year. Um, soccer and football are the number one sport, the number one travel sport. Um, locally, about 17% or about 500,000 people travel to Monroe County either to watch a sport or participate in a sport or yell at referees or whatever it is they do in, in many, many ways. Um, spending about $80 million annually in our region, um, helping to support about 2,000 jobs. Um, uh, as Kelly indicated, you know, eco obviously economically, it's, it's a huge boon for our area. We are, we are a sports community. We know it. We feel it. We are home of the Hoosiers. Um, specifically um, on the west side of our community, um, the, the county out on the county side there. What an amazing opportunity this is. Um, it, you know, th this would be just that 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 area, obviously, side of our community. Um, it's it's less expensive. It's less expensive for a group to come there and and stay in the hotels and use those resources, which is what a sports group is looking for. A lot of times, they spend a little bit less. They travel in larger parties, as Kelly talked about. They travel with grandma and grandpa, brother, sister, those types of people, um, which again is is great for 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 the quality of life aspect of that. They're able to come here and, and be together and experience that. So, so not only is it economics, but it is a big part of, of quality of life. But um, you know, these synthetic fields there, um, um, again, will just, just as you've heard already talking about the, the weather delays and, and things like that. But when it comes to our ability to market and, and sell Cars Farm Park, which again, I wanna say right now is a remark remarkable facility um, already, and, and we're lucky to have it um, with, with all the amenities out there, and have done lots of great things out there, and we will co will continue to do so. But 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 adding this amenity or, or adding this um, feature of of these um, synthetic fields will definitely um, allow us to compete with um, Deaconess down in Evansville, Grand Park in Westfield, get our foot in the door with some of these places that won't even talk to us unless we have synthetic fields for their championship. Um, games and things like that. And with with that, I want to turn it over to to Pete. Let him talk specifically about more of that. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Go ahead, Pete. Thank you. Um, so I've been with Visit Bloomington for about eight years and had the opportunity to discuss tournaments with various tournament directors and uh, the various opportunities. Obviously, Cars Farm Park has been a, a great partner to us with. Um, with USA Quidditch and the Cutter Soccer and those type of events. Um, but there are so many other tournaments and, and travel teams that we could be hosting, um, like Mike said, with the ability to have those turf fields. I think the biggest thing is the major rain events that we've already talked about. Um, tournament directors don't wanna have to cancel their tournament once all the parents have paid for the hotels and the tournament fees and all those and send them packing because that's very difficult uh, monetarily. Um, so those two turf fields would allow them to, whether it's condense their schedule or delay or go longer, things like that, um, to be able to get those tournaments in like we, we want them to. Um, so some groups that we've talked to that we've already established a relationship with are uh, USA Ultimate, um, the National Horseshoe Pitchers Association, US Quidditch, 
Um, we could possibly host some U.S. Youth Soccer Regionals. Um, we've already established a partnership with 3B3 Live Soccer to host a, a local tournament, but they are interested in a uh, regional or national event as well. Um, and then kind of an untapped market for us is lacrosse. I was actually the club lacrosse coach at IU for 10 years. Um, stepped down a couple years ago to, to focus on family and, and everything else. But I have a very, um, I'm very in tune with the lacrosse community. I worked for Trilogy Lacrosse for three summers doing um, national uh, tournaments and camps throughout the country. I would travel for eight weeks of the summer. Um, I had them out for a site visit a few years ago and they love, they love Bloomington, they love the community. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't risk their tournaments with, with the rain issues and things like that. Um, another group is Lacrosse America. We've had out before to, to look at the fields. Um, it's actually an IU alumni that runs that group. They're in um, South Bend, they're in Columbus, Ohio. They would love to do an event in Bloomington, but similar thing where um, without having any synthetic turf, their, their risk of canceling due to rain events um, was just too much and they want to stick around where they knew they could get those tournaments in. So um, a couple, couple more that we would possibly be able to host that would have a local and regional impact are all the various IU club sports. Like I mentioned, I coached the men's lacrosse team for 10 years. We use Cars Farm Park all the time for practices and games. Um, I know that their women's lacrosse team, the men's and women's club soccer teams, men's and women's rugby, as well as men's and women's ultimate frisbee would all be interested in using those synthetic turf fields for their club tournaments because um, IU does have the recreational sports facility, but that was built in, uh, in a way that they wanted it to be used for intramural sports first. So club sports are kind of an afterthought or a secondary option for them. So those teams are always looking for field space as well. So um, that's kind of where we were going. Then um, some events that we've lost other areas that would be, be good for synthetic, um, USA Rugby Regional, uh, Spike Ball, Collegiate Regionals, um, USA Archery, as well as another lacrosse tournament called Lax Bash Tournaments that went to Michigan instead. So there's a, a breadth of opportunities for us if we were able to upgrade and get to a newer, newer facility. So that's all I got. Thank you. Question. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Yes. I, I, and, and this is a little sarcastic, and I'm <laughs> going to apologize in advance. But since the fields that we're looking at are so close to the airport, do you think Quidditch is a is a good is a good fit? <laughs> I think that's a great great selling point that we could talk to them about. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you telling us something about yourself and your Quidditch aspirations here, or what? I mean, I've seen a movie where they go pretty high. <laughs> well, I do want to remind that it's an athletic complex. It's not just for soccer. Jeff can come out with his broom anytime <laughs> and play on the Quidditch team. And I'm sure we can work something out with the airport. But anyway, we do have Andy Knutes. He's the engineer, and he is, uh, has, is very knowledgeable in infield now, I think. And he can explain to you what it is. And I, I also, for terminology, the soccer community, athletic community, when they say the word turf, they mean synthetic turf. Some other people might go, well, is it synthetic or grass? Well, if they say the word turf, they mean synthetic. Is that the same for if they use the term carpet? I, well, it is a carpet, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Andy Knust, civil engineer with Bledsoe Rigger Cooper James. And I've had the pleasure of working with Kelly in the Parks and Rec Department for a number of years now on many of their facilities. And as you know, the Karst Farm Park is their largest park and the Karst Athletic Complex is a major component of the Karst Farm Park. And uh, as Kelly mentioned, you know, there's 12 fields out there and I prepared this this report, this is kind of the, this, the supplement to the original report, but between the couple of reports I've prepared, we've identified needs, maintenance, and you know upkeep. We've identified irrigation and drainage projects that, that really need to be implemented throughout the karst complex to maintain these fields and keep them in, in top condition. And the investment into doing the the synthetic turf fields will really, in my mind, that's kind of the key to allowing all the other improvements to happen. Because as Kelly mentioned, 
you know, if we go in now, like fields nine through 12, none of them have irrigation or drainage. And so the playing conditions on those four fields are honestly not very good. Mm -hmm. And so, but to install the irrigation and drainage, as Kelly mentioned, like, you know, it would, it would force all the play off of those fields for a year probably. And then all the other fields are gonna get really worn out. So really the, the key there is to do the synthetic fields first because then play can happen on those fields right away. And all the other fields in the whole complex can have a chance to relax and not get pressured with so much additional play while these other two fields are being under construction because the construction can happen fast and they can play on them. Now, um, so I, I see the, the implementation, implementation of these synthetic fields as kind of the key to raising playing conditions, not just on those synthetic turf fields, but on all the other grass fields as well. Um, now, there are some, there's, there's some, a lot of details to be figured out. Uh, and the infill is one of those, one of those uh, details. Uh, the, the standard for synthetic turf fields since the 90s at least, and I mean, the first synthetic turf fields were installed way back in the 60s at some time. Um, but the, the standard infill material has been a mixture of, of sand and crumb rubber. And the crumb rubber is important because it absorbs impact. And so that's, you know, one of the primary health and safety concerns is about, you know, what happens when you hit the ground. You know, that's how concussions happen and other injuries can happen largely from, you know, a contact with the ground. So, uh, so traditionally synthetic rubber has been, or the synthetic rubber, crumb rubber has been used to absorb that impact. And, um, but there are some, some newer technologies coming out now that can do the same thing with a shock pad that goes underneath the carpet, essentially. And that will basically make the, the shock absorption across the field more uniform throughout the entire field. Tell them about the infill, what the infill? Oh. Okay, so the infill, like there's fibers in the, in the, think of it as a carpet, because that's really what the synthetic turf is. And the infill is like granulated rubber and sand that goes between those, those carpet fibers, basically, and helps the, the fibers to stand up straight and provides like some ballast, some weight to it, so that uh, when a player or the ball is moving across that surface, like there's, there's some ground feel there, right? And that absorbs the energy from the ball, from the player's feet, from the players hitting the ground. So, um, so newer, well, there's some concerns about the crumb rubber, as Kelly alluded to, like, uh, you know, a lot of the crumb rubber is derived from, from used tires. So as a result, there's, you know, there's PAHs and there's plasticizers. There's all kinds of chemicals that are used in the manufacture of that rubber material. And there's been a lot of concern about exposure to that. Um, EPA and CDC have some, some federal studies that are looking into it now. And they've identified that, yes, there are chemicals of concern in this chrome rubber material. Uh, but thus far, they haven't actually connected exposure to that crumb rubber material in an athletic field. They haven't actually connected that to any particular health outcomes. So, so there is cause for concern there, but thus far it isn't like a proven, proven cause and effect. However, there is cause for concern. The studies are still ongoing. Um, so one way to mitigate any possible risk there is to use a different infill material. So there's, there's newer infill materials that are derived from like wood particles. One product is, is called Brockfill and it's really like, I wouldn't call it sawdust. It's like, but it's wood, it's wood particles, right? And it's, they're specially processed to create like a rounded particle similar to how the crumb rubber is. But of course, wood doesn't have the same shock absorbance that you'd get from rubber. So, 
So the, the, the newer method is to put like a shock pad, a foamy shock pad underneath the, the carpet with the wood fiber infill, or there's an also uh, one that I'm kind of even more interested in is the use of this coconut fiber material. So it's more fibrous and right, you kind of work it in between the fibers of the synthetic turf and it really simulates more like, you know, the natural thatch that you'd get in a, a natural grass field. And so it doesn't move around as much as you'd get with like a granular kind of material. So, so that's something we're really interested in. Um, it does cost a little more, primarily because the, the, the application of the shock pad is necessary to get the, an, a good G-max rating. So G-max is like the, the, the way that they measure the, the shock absorbency of the surface. So um, another, let's see, another cause for possible concern is about like other kinds of injuries that might happen on synthetic turf. Uh, we had some questions about this during the parks board meeting last week. Um, there, there is due to, let's see, uh, from studies by the NCAA and NFL, they found that there can be an increased risk of like non-contact injuries. So knees and ankles, they found through, you know, hundreds of playing events and hundreds of injuries on different kinds of surfaces, they found that there does seem to be an increased risk of non-contact injuries on synthetic turf. Now, I'll say the NCAA, they play on synthetic turf a lot, and they also play on, on grass fields a lot, but think of what kind of grass fields are they playing on? Same with the NFL. They're playing on the best, well-maintained grass fields that you can think of, like here, at IU, they play on Yeagley Field, which is very beautiful and well-maintained, has excellent drainage underneath and irrigation. Think of fields nine through 12 out at Cars Farm Park, where there is no irrigation, no drainage, and really poor clay soils. So I'd say, that, you know, if we think about the current condition of those four fields versus some synthetic fields in, the, in place of those, like, I. I haven't done the G-Max rating myself yet, but we, we might very well do this soon on, on those existing clay fields. Like I, I'm willing to bet that the conditions on those fields is gonna be much more dangerous than actually a, a well-maintained synthetic turf that's consistent across the entire playing surface, no puddles and divots and, and things like that. You know, like right in front of the goal box, you know, the turf gets really worn out in particular. So you've got a lot of variability across different parts of the field, and that makes conditions much more dangerous, especially for twisted ankles and things if you've got holes in the ground. So, um, so acknowledging those risks, but I think in this kind of cir circumstance, I, I really believe that synthetic turf fields are, are going to be a, a wise choice. And and uh, Kelly also mentioned the temperature effects, and that's another thing, another advantage of the synthetic, that's another advantage of the natural infill materials versus crumb rubber, because uh, like the coconut fiber and the wood fiber materials, they retain moisture for much longer than rubber particles, and therefore like they keep the surface temperature much lower on the playing field. So. Um, still synthetic turf is going to be hotter surface temperature than like a natural grass field, but using this, the natural infill material will mitigate that effect quite a bit. So I'm excited to see some, some synthetic turf get installed, particularly with some natural infill material. I think that would be a great thing for the Karst Athletic Complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any questions for Andy? I, I'm just curious, yeah. um, with the natural fill that you're speaking of, um, the coconut fibers um, fill, is anybody using that currently, like in the NFL? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and yeah. are they finding that, um, my son played football, and um, he played, he's always played on on the chrome rubber, I believe it was, because mm -hmm. they 
socks would be covered in little tiny, you know, yeah. balls. Um, and I can, you know, there was the ankle and knee issue that you referenced. I, I have to wonder if that the chrome, the chrome rubber, if you will. Um, it seems like they, they didn't always have the, the, the grip that they needed. And I'm wondering if there's a better grip because you referenced the thatch yeah. um, c component of the fibrous. So is it shown to be a better, um, better for the athletes' ankles and knees? Potentially, yeah. Okay. I, don't, I don't know if there's, any, if there's enough body of research out sure. there yet to, to do that comparison about the, the coconut fiber kind of infill versus uh -huh. the granulated kind of infill, but it, it sure seems like something to look into. Yeah, it and, makes sense to me. Yeah, Anna. but, but they, are, they are installing fields with that material in Indiana now. Like I, I've just been in contact with the sales rep. Um, he said that at Carmel, Carmel High School, and they just put in uh, soccer fields there with the with this coconut fiber infill, and they've got another field just adjacent. The football field at Carmel High School is has the synthetic turf with rubber, crumb rubber, and he sent me some some temperature surface temperature shots in particular, and like on the same day at the same time the the coconut fiber infill was like 30 degrees cooler. 30. So, yeah, because I do know that crumb rubber is hot yeah, when they're out there. Yeah, so that's that's also an important consideration. Yeah. But, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see some more data about the, the non-contact injuries like you're, yeah. you're asking about. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions I can answer about technical details here? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, does the ball behave in the same way when it hits synthetic turf as it does when it hits? Oh, I might have Lewis to is saying no. no. <laughs> that, from... And does this not cause any problems in adjustments? Uh, for, well, one thing I can say is that uh, synthetic turf would be more consistent yeah. across the entire field, yeah. whereas okay. with grass, you know, you get a lot of extra you get more impact on certain parts of the field around the center and and in front of the goal boxes and so like just that having that variability is going to change the way the ball behaves yeah um, but any other thing to add um yeah bottom line it's similar to if you think about tennis and the different surfaces that they have in tennis and each different surface you're going to play on you're going to get a different reaction on turf um, the ball moves quicker. It is very, it's very predictable, but it also um, doesn't lose its momentum as quickly. Like when you're playing on grass, there's less, you know, there's less resistance. And so passes go faster. Your touch is like you, a touch that you would make you're dribbling the ball on, on, on grass. If you do that on turf and it's a little heavy, the ball just keeps running away from you. Also in windy conditions, the ball, it's very different as well. Um, bounces are higher. It's a different way of playing. The fact that we don't have turf in Bloomington, it's, I alluded to this briefly, means that when we do go play at someplace like Grand Park, where a lot of championships are happening or whatever else, Bloomington players sometimes are at a disadvantage unless they've had a lot of experience playing on turf before because the game goes so much faster. Um, and so it's better for the um, I didn't talk a lot about the uh, development of the players as soccer players, but it's very good for the development of soccer players to play on such on, on those materials because of the difference that it makes. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Well, I know we've given you a great. Oh, yes, I do actually. So, um, more comments. Uh, but um, so uh, I find all of this very intriguing. I think it's a great idea. I love the idea of saving water and not mowing and you know how much that helps our environment, which is which is wonderful. Um, I ended up looking up how much carbon a lawn sequesters, a uh, grass sequesters. So. 46 to 127 grams of carbon per square meter per year, but that's less than trees. So we'd be losing some carbon sequestration, but I think we, we could plant a few more trees out. <laughs> out of the we love park. trees. I know, I know, there's, there's so many out there now. Um, so, but I just wanted to, to point that out. On balance, it, it seems environmentally, this is a really smart thing. 
Um, so here's what I would like to see, and I think, I think this is doable. If you took the current um, rental uh, frequency of um, the two most requested fields, and you did a business plan for synthetic, you could determine how much you could charge. You know what the market will bear as well, right? But you can determine how much you will charge. You don't even have to include the fact that it'll probably get more use and, and you, you can just leave it at rates that are, you know, of usage that are current for the, for the um, lawn, for the grass, um, and see where that nets you out in, in 10 years uh, when it has to be replaced. And, and I would encourage you to think bigger. I would encourage you to uh, not just think about replacing the two fields in 10 years, but using a non-reverting fund to uh, start building up capital to do other fields uh, because we shouldn't just do two. Um, but that's just my opinion. Uh, but I think, um, you know, I think this is a great case. I think, I, you know, I agree that this is good. I, I uh, am hesitant to um, provide full-throated support for using food and beverage money for this, but uh, that's not what this is about today anyway. But I do appreciate all the information. So thank you all for being here and uh, sharing your insight and your expertise too. And I think too, when you talk about creating this capital development fund, that if you can show in this kind of business plan that the savings from the artificial turf that you would have every single year, if you can show putting that into that reserve would make a difference also. One of the things that we've talked about at the parks meeting that I didn't hear today too, is that this would extend the season over which you can play and do different things, especially when we talk about rugby. I mean, blood makes the grass grow. I don't know what it does to synthetic turf, but um, you have to hose it down, right? <laughs> but, um, but I think that, that there's opportunities for it, not just more use for other kinds of sports, but for the extending that season, which improves the income from it as well. And, and John and Matt have already actually crunched numbers and we probably could have those very shortly. Uh, John's did a lot of research on what the rental fee would be and what we'd be taking in. So we, can, we basically have all those numbers already. I think also you need to take into account the, um, the health of the other fields and what that means for income also as, as you're doing these things. I don't know if John already has, but, um, and I wanna thank Andy. This is, uh, this is the second time I've heard about infill and I finally understand it. <laughs> so. we, we do appreciate, like I said, um, I'm hoping to go on July 11th to the council. I don't know exactly since we've never done this before, what is the next step? I don't know and I don't know the timetables. I don't always know the timetables for the general obligation bonds, et cetera. So to keep that in mind. Um, I think, should we take the temperature of the group here to see what we'd like to see going forward? Well, I, th I think we could ask Angie to think about ways <laughs> that we could fund this. Like what are, what are some potential funding mechanisms, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if we have some options, then I think we can give you some better direction. Okay. And, and, um, and then it's a matter of whether it comes to us or council first, and we could, depending on the mechanism, right? So, um, so if, I think that would be great if Angie wouldn't mind doing that. And, and I personally am in favor of the two synthetic fields with the new lighting. So yeah, I don't know. Definitely, I, yeah, I support it. I just don't know that food and beverage is the way to go, so. What, 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 are, what are you looking at? <laughs> Oh, yes. 
How to get on Angie's now, good hold side. On. <laughs> now, hold on a minute. Well, Andy is our uh, uh, designer for literally everything. Restrooms, trails, basketball courts, shelters, drainage. <laughs> I will put it on my list. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Angie. <laughs> so um, we'll go to the council. We'll, I'll keep in touch with Angie, and we'll just see if we can keep this going forward. Yeah. And you tell us what you need from yeah. us and vice versa. I appreciate everyone coming today. Yeah. And you have no more questions? No, I, I think it's good to go to council just to provide the information. And hey, they may come up with some ideas. Okay. And, and I like the idea of, of selling name rights to the field as well. I think that could be bringing extra money and it's a 10 year. Depends whose name it is, but yes. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of sports. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and of course, I think, Jeff, is it a Nimbus 2000 you want? <laughs> I, I think that's a two years ago model. Oh. I think I want the 4,500. 4,000. So I can. Uh... Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who yeah. came out. Yes. Appreciate your enthusiasm. What? Well, well, and Andy and the others are so knowledgeable. I mean, so knowledgeable. I'm going to go back and start playing soccer again. <laughs> so. Whew. Yeah, I'm ready to go out to Cars Farm Park again, too. Uh, <laughs> So the next item on here is a discussion of a formation of a climate resilience task force. And I think uh, council member Iverson is here to talk with us. Um, Hello, commissioners. Thank you for uh, hearing this today. Uh, thank you also for uh, signing the contract with Indiana University. Um, to uh, make sure that uh, we can have this climate action uh, resilience uh, today. Um, as you know, on May 3rd, you approved this collaboration agreement between the Monroe County government and the trustees of Indiana University. This also allows us to have a McKinney Climate Fellow. Um, his name is Hader Atik, and he and I have been working very closely together. Um, as part of this contract, um, we need to be forming a task force. Uh, you can see in your packets that there's information on uh, kind of the, the, what the task force should be. If you look on page 10 of your work session packet, you can find out more about the work, uh, the, the task force and the different um, categories from the community that um, they're recommended to come from. That is to say, stakeholders representing different sectors of the community. And then on page seven is a very helpful graphic of the entire process that this task force will help um, uh, the climate fellow uh, work with. Um, today, we, um, we have already uh, heard back from 13 individuals that they'd like to be on this task force, but we don't know what to do with them. So today, we'd like to come to you and seek your advice uh, and your guidance on uh, this task force, where should it go in the organizational chart of Monroe County? So um, are you coming here today to ask the commissioners to form the task force? Yes, we need to formally, uh, today is a discussion uh, to kind of think about the different issues that, that uh, exist. And then at your discretion, uh, you'll actually formally uh, form that task force and then they can start meeting. Uh, we've had conversations with Indiana University uh, to determine that indeed this is a Monroe County task force. It's not an Indiana University task force. So uh, we need to think about uh, the different, uh, you know, uh, ins and outs of, of that task force. So, um... I don't know, Commissioner Jones, how much you've been involved. I thought you were supposed to also be involved with um, the fellow, but um, how large of a group are you considering this should be? Um, this has mostly been in the hands of Mr. Iverson um, so far, and I believe he mentioned up to 20 people. 
in the group, which is considerably more than they actually recommend. That, well, that's right. The task force is recommended to consist of eight to 12 stakeholders. Uh, and right now we have 13 individuals that have said they're interested. So we have a little bit more than what's recommended. Um, and so we're in a good spot in terms of people that are interested in helping Monroe County with this initiative. Uh, we just need to form it. I am curious about how you identified these people. Sure, so uh, we created a spreadsheet um, that listed out who we thought were stakeholders in the community that would have interest in climate resilience. Uh, this was created in the Environmental Commission and we talked about that in the Environmental Commission. And then we also shared that spreadsheet with our colleagues over in the city who are also uh, working in a resilience cohort. Uh, and so the reason we shared it with our colleagues in the city was to make sure that the Monroe County Task Force was represented by people who come from Monroe County, live or work or do work in Monroe County, and then the city task force would be comprised of individuals who predominantly uh, do work inside city limits. Yes. Um, one of the, it seems that one of the ideal situations for a task force of this kind is to not necessarily have entirely people who are um, clearly in favor of it, but to actually get dissenting voices. Um, have you been able to do that at all? I have not polled people on their attitudes towards the climate crisis or climate resiliency, but I completely agree with you that we don't want to have an echo chamber of people that think just like you and me. And then how about the informal um, leadership, which I found to be a rather interesting idea. Did you identify people that would satisfy that? Can you say more about informal leadership? Uh, they, they suggest that it's a really good idea to um, include people on this task force who are informal leaders within the county. Um, not necessarily elected, um, although they possibly could be, but their leadership exists outside of that arena. Sure, yeah, so Friends of Lake Monroe have gotten back to us and they're very interested in having a representative on this board. That's not an elected uh, position or uh, a municipal body, so that's a good example. And then also the newly reformed Sierra Club um, has also indicated interest and then they would be joining uh, other folks that uh, play a role here in Monroe County, such as uh, individuals with storm and water or soil and water, and those sorts of organizations. Yeah, I, I think I, I maybe understood that a little, a little differently, but I don't wanna. Oh no, I, I think you've looked at this far more than I have. I'd like to hear this. Um, I understood that, that it would be a person, not like a group, but a person who's well known within the community and known to have a wide array of community interests. Um, an activist? Y yes, probably more of an activist. Sure, yeah, and, and you know, we have reached out to those sorts of people and what I, I think I would also uh, point out is that as the task force has not yet been formed, we have not issued formal invitations for people to join. We've simply put out feelers to say, you know, this is a task force that's part of the contract. Would you be interested? So we know that folks are interested, but if there's additional folks that you think that uh, we can reach out to, uh, I think we could definitely do that. Okay, thank you. Well, and, and if this is an official task force that we create, um, they would need to apply through the commissioners, correct? And then what kind of time frame are you envisioning this task force would continue to exist? Uh, Commissioner Githens, I'm gonna look to the legal team to talk to see if that is indeed correct about applying to the Board of Commissioners. I don't know. Well, I guess my... The question I would have before I could answer that is, uh, you referred to we, is the we the environmental commission or is the we you and the IU intern? So um, uh, Molly Turner King has uh, suggested some 
uh, ways that we could create this task force. And one of them was to have the task force uh, be embedded in the Environmental Commission. Another option would be to have it be a part of the Board of Commissioners, and the Board of Commissioners would would have you know oversight of that task force. So I, I think it kind of depends on where this goes in the Monroe County government structure. And, and I guess maybe the, I, I was curious whether you know all this work was being done by the Environmental Commission or whether it was a different group because I think mm -hmm. that would inform the answer. But but I guess the. The legal answer is that we do not necessarily have to have an application process, although functionally and practically we are always have. Um, I think that when we form any kind of non-statutory board of commission, we, we, we look at appointments, who gets to make appointments and things like that. I think that would be something you would look at as you're forming a new uh, commission or a new task force. So I, I, I think there are some options there. I don't think it necessarily is the commissioners appoint the entire task force. I think the commissioners would decide who gets to make the appointments to the task force. Um, I, I, I'm also, I guess in my mind, if the environmental commission is the right kind of overseer, maybe mm -hmm. delegate some of this these duties and give them the authority to, to oversee the, the, the the, the newly developed task force. Just a couple of things that are running through my mind as as we move forward. Sure, um, and and to to kind of get back to your questions, Commissioner Githens, um, in the packet um, we have indicated that we're expecting it to be about fifty to sixty hours of time over a twelve to sixteen month period. Um, and as you can see on the chart on page seven of the work packet. Um, they're going to be working with us to do a series of deliverables, and the end deliverable is going to be that climate resilience plan for the county. And so at the end of that 12 to 16 months, uh, we would have that uh, climate resilience plan. Right now, what, they're, what they would be doing is working with the climate uh, fellow to, uh, to work on like community uh, attitude surveys and help plan an event coming up uh, later in July. Um, an event in July when we don't even have a task force? Or is this strictly the fellow doing this? That, that would be the fellow doing that, yeah. Okay. But, uh, go ahead. That's all right. I'll wait. Go ahead. I did want to provide some clarity on um, the three options that I had identified as ways possible to move forward. Um, I had spoke with um, one of the representatives from the Resilience Institute at IU, and she had mentioned um, ways that other counties had handled the formation of this task force. And some other counties do use their environmental commission, but as every county's commissions differ, their environmental commissions could actually be bigger to accommodate a committee of this size. Um, so I think the three tasks that I would, and I, Jeff, I think, and I have talked about this. The options I see is make it the Environmental Commission as is, expand the Environmental Commission, and that's assuming if the Environmental Commission is A, available to commit this amount of time and the right um, body or commission to oversee this work, or three, develop a new task force. And I think if you develop a new task force, then it's up to the county on how to form that as far as appointments and things like that. Thank you. Okay, so so last night at the council meeting, uh, Mr. Iverson, you said that the group has been selected and there's a meeting scheduled. So that's why I was really confused because that can't happen until other things happen. Sure, so. yeah, let me clarify. So the, the task force uh, has been sent, like I said, uh, and, and reach out to say, would you be interested in this? So that's the only co conversation that we've had with folks. So a body has not been established. Individuals have not been uh, told that they're part of a body. Uh, we've simply reached out to folks through this climate fellow to say, would you be interested? Okay. The and event is something that Commissioner Githens and I were just talking about that right. is something that the climate fellow is working with his IU counterparts to put on. Right, but we would need a task force first. The is that is that the is that the meeting you were talking about yesterday? Sure. Yes. 
So the, the feedback that we've gotten from uh, the uh, ERI at Indiana University, the Environmental Resilience Institute, is that the task force's uh, purpose uh, would be to uh, develop that climate resilience plan. It wouldn't right. necessarily be to do these, these other steps in the interim. So yeah, the, um, it does make it clear that they that any members of the task force should expect to be involved in any of these other happenings. Sure. Yeah. So it would be better to have the. That's my question. Wouldn't it make sense to have the task force before this meeting, because they would then be behind, right? That's pretty much the way I understood the timeline. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, the, and we're happy to do, you know, what the commissioners uh, would recommend yeah. in this matter. That's why we wanted to come for a discussion today. Yeah. Yeah. So you said we we asked people who's we. The climate action or the climate resilience fellow Hader Atif. Okay. Uh, he uh, and I have been working with. Uh, not only the Environmental Commission, but also our, our uh, folks at the ERI at Indiana University. Right. To, so ERI puts on weekly webinars. We're on you know, these meetings all the time. And the, uh, the parts of the packet today that go through what is a task force come from a much larger document. Right. right. And because students are involved, Indiana University has this timeline they're trying to move people along on. But I also understand that's not our timeline. Mm. We can, you know, we can go kind of at the speed that we want. However, I would point out that the McKinney Fellow uh, will go down to part time starting with the school year. Uh, he will stay with us to get that climate action plan right. uh, written with this task force. Uh, so that's yeah. kind of where we're at. So yeah, so I get all that, and I understand it's it is it is very time sensitive. Um, but that's why I'm asking if if we need to get something together for next week in order to be ready for this first meeting, because it seems, yeah. So um, so the other question I have is, um, my understanding from the May meeting when this was all presented was that the fellow, and I hate that name, uh, <laughs> the fellow, is being supervised jointly by you two, Commissioner Jones and you, as members of the Environmental Commission, right? Is that true? So uh, Hader and I have weekly meetings uh, to make sure that he's on task. Uh, both Commissioner Jones and I have looked at his work plan. We both looked at um, the climate resilient or the climate vulnerabilities um, work that he's done, and we are also working with him on the survey that he's written. Right. So we we are reviewing all of his work. Right, right. But yeah. but wouldn't you be at a meeting, Commissioner Jones, with the weekly meeting? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, as this came into being, it was the time of year when Fridays are extremely difficult for me to find any mm -hmm. extra time, and they are actually meeting on a Friday. Uh, and, and now that uh, Mr. Atik is coming back to the United States and he'll be in person, I think it would be entirely appropriate to revisit that meeting schedule. Yeah, I think I would, that I was, would recommend that. That would certainly help. Yeah. Me to be able to be a more active yeah. participant. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I would recommend that uh, because it's um, it's important to have both input from both of you um, rather than just one of you. I think that's important. So, um, okay. So I have, I have another question related yeah. to the fellow, if I could, because I think it impacts what we're talking about too. You said that this would be uh, something that occurs over 12 to 16 months is the, uh, fellow going to be around for a full 16 months? Uh, we, let's see. I thought it was only a year max. The, the fellow, the way that the contract is written and it, the way I at least understand it is the fellow is going to be full time during the summer right. and then they'll go down to part time during the, uh, the fall semester. So they'll, so Hader has been, you know, here for a, a month. It, you signed the contract about a month ago. So, so then what happens after his time 
I, I think that would be work that this task force could pick up and, and do. I, again, the end goal for all of this work is the Climate Resilience Plan, which is a document that guides the work of, of resiliency here in the county for the commissioners and the council. So um, if the, the fellow is no longer available to do this work, then I think the task force would be a good place for that work to, uh, to continue or be finalized. But again, this is up, up to you and... Okay. I, I was... Sorry. My impression is that while, yes, the, the main task of the task force mm -hmm. is um, to come up with a plan, the materials actually then talk about how it needs to move to an implement, implementation stage and that the task force actually remains involved to kind of um, keep track of what is being implemented, what's working and what's not working, where revisions are needed and things of that sort. Uh, Commissioner Jones, you're absolutely correct. Um, the, the plan that uh, Indiana University is working with does suggest an implementation team. And I think depending on how you structure this task force, that could eventually become the implementation team, or it could be made flexible enough to move members in and out based upon their skill sets. Um, I, I would like to return to whether, to the three options that Ms. Turner King brought up. Yes. Um, I, 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 personally, I, I just, uh, there may be some overlap in the Venn diagram in my mind with Environmental Commission, but I certainly don't think that this is appropriate to to uh, hand off to the Environmental Commission because it, it, it does require um, such uh, additional commitment of time and energy, uh, no pun intended. Um, so um, I think a separate task force would make sense and I think we need to work through as quickly as possible, um, members, chair, and all that good stuff, which I think we could do. I yeah, could do. I, I agree. I, I do not think that the current Environmental Commission could really successfully oversee this. In, in general, people seem to feel that uh, they don't have a lot of extra time to give. But also, I would like to point out that there are other aspects of environmentalism than merely mm -hmm. climate yep. change. And, exactly. and I would want the Environmental Commission to continue to focus on some other aspects. If I may, Commissioners, um, to clarify, the McKinney Fellow, and I'm looking at the contract right now, he's here for his, the duration of the contract is from May to August with 200 hours of support for the county over a 16 week academic semester. There's the option to extend into the fall, which would include from August to December, but that option, as of right now, I don't know that we've said we're doing that. That is true. I guess I, I guess I would need to see who's been asked if they're interested um, or invited. Um, I'd be happy to, to forward that to you. Um, and and then I think um, we just need to come up with a plan for um, officially inviting people to an official task force that we need to officially form. <laughs> And we also need to officially assign tasks to them, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I, I think probably clarify what deliverables are. That's right. Exactly. And, yeah, and we put a lot of information in the packet today um, that kind of helps guide that, that work. So, Commissioner Jones, you are spot on. So, uh, yeah, I would, in addition to see who's invited, I'd like to see what we would normally see for people who apply to boards and commissions, which is a little bit of their background and why they're interested mm -hmm. in this. Um, I always find that very helpful. Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, Commissioner Givens, to that point, um, you will receive not only the full spreadsheet, 
with all of those uh, that we considered inviting, that didn't invite, and those who said no, and all that fun stuff, but as well as just that, that smaller list of those that said they would be interested uh, in receiving an invitation should the commissioners get to that point. And did you explain the time commitment to all these folks? Yes, uh, the, uh, the, doc, the, the longer document that you have in your, your uh, packet, um, there's an appendices that includes a, uh, a, a form letter essentially. So uh, we, it has a lot of the same information that's on um, the executive summary for today. Yeah. It would have just been better to do this the other way around, I think. I, I don't want anybody to feel slighted if they don't actually get invited. Um, but neither here nor there, it's already done. I it looked like Jeff had something. Well, I, I guess in my mind, I, what I'm hearing is that we're gonna look at creating a task force. I, I'm kind of, maybe it is and maybe it is. Is this kind of, I mean, in my, in my mind, there is a kind of a temporary task force that I would, that traditionally, I think we would prepare a resolution for. It has a limited duration. It doesn't go into our code because then in two years, we'd have to remove it from the code. Is that the type of document we're looking at? Okay. Sounds like it. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 there was, it's, then, then there was the implementation, and then, then the implementation. Who knows how long? I, I, I just kind of trying to get my head around. Yeah, it, I, I think, I think it could be that the implementation group could be a longer term group, a different group, but I don't want to jump to that okay. place yet. Right until the task force is actually met, yeah. been formed and met, and formed, appointed and met. Yeah, 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 and yeah. to see maybe, and then that maybe becomes something. Oh, they, a permanent or even a short-term uh, it, group itself. And it could be that the, also this is ways that the county itself could be making changes mm -hmm. to yeah. add to this. And yes. so, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, it may be then, internal, it's just county, right. yeah, working group like trails. I think we mentioned that as well. Yeah. We also um, need to, decide how appointments, or I guess maybe I should say who will make appointments. I would think that'd be part of what, yeah, I think the that's guiding, mm -hmm. yeah. So who's going to write this up? Uh, I, I'll work with Molly and we'll, okay. we'll try to figure that out. Um, right. So the, the, the other question is, I've heard 13 members is that where people want to are comfortable I, with, or do or do we just leave that blank for now and yeah, I think fill I that think in later? I leave that blank. Yeah, for the moment. And, and again, you know, there, there's no invitation that's been sent, sure. folks. Yeah, so there's there's some folks that are interested that you can pick and choose from. And of course, with it becoming a formal task force, there will be a quorum um, yeah. that will be necessary and the more people we put on it, the harder it is to come up with a quorum. And, and does this, uh, the number that you're talking about include the two of you? Or no. is those, are those additional people? No, and it also does not include uh, Nolan Hendon, who is the current president of the Environmental Commission. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Starts to be a little bit unwieldy at times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, I, if we could, and one of the things that is mentioned is that there are individuals who might cover more than That's one right. aspect That's of right. this. Right. Yeah. I would kind of prefer to go for eight or nine people, mm -hmm. assuming we could find those kinds mm -hmm. of individuals. Mm -hmm. I, I do think it's important that most of these areas that are listed become involved. I, I think the, the challenge for uh, what's moving forward is to uh, limit it. People are very excited about this. People are very excited about working on climate change issues. And so um, the problem is not going to be too many people, or too few people, it's going to be too many. Well, and you can bring people in to talk with you. Yes, Commissioner well. Githens, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just, yeah, I just it just feels like things have been decided outside of what needs to happen officially. So I think if we can get something together, we, meaning Jeff and Molly, sorry, uh, can 
if we can have something to look at for next week, I think that would be ideal. Um, we'll do our and best. Then we should talk about members and things like that as well in the near future. So, anything else, Mr. Uh, no, commissioners. I thank you for your time. You had a late night last night and a long meeting today. So, thank you very much for your attention. Not as long as your meeting. <laughs> but it kept me from reading through all this stuff in this yeah. work packet, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Our meetings are still short. Yeah, <laughs> comparatively, yeah. Shocking. Next item is uh, hearing from Jeff Cockrell over the le legal department over ordinance 2023-24, the creation of a capital improvement board. And yes, we, we did this last fall, and but it was contingent upon uh, some things that didn't happen. Uh, essentially what, you, and this is the ordinance establishing the CIB. And I think we've had a lot of conversations about the interlocal dealing with the CIB and, and, and they're different in this way. This, this ordinance, the, the state statute authorizes the board of commissioners to create the CIB. And so this, that's what this does. It creates the CIB. It says who gets to make appointments and does that kind of basic work. I think the interlocal is much more of how do the city and county assets interact with the Convention and Visitors Commission so they can continue to do their great work and the, the expansion and the CIB, which would, would kind of take over a lot of the infrastructure and management uh, oversight with, with the convention center. So that, that is by its nature going to be a much more complex document. Right, because it's got a lot more, more things and it's got a lot more people who have to approve it. Um, so what this does is it kind of gives the basic, and I think it's reflective of what was in the draft in our local in that there are six appointments, or six appointments, three are made by the city, or really seven, but three are made by the city, two by the mayor, one by the city council. Two are made by the commissioners, one by the county council, and then those six will would would pick the seventh member. Um, and there are some political affiliations associated with with the commissioners and the mayors, so that we, when we get to the end, we can't have more than four from any political party on the board. So it, it reflects that it, it indicates that the CIB will basically select a site for the expansion of the convention center, including the site plan, you know, contract with for the operations and the management, oversees the hotel addition process, you know, kind of all those things that, you know, we've been talking about with the city for, for years and, but it, it would, it would put that in there. And, and it also, and I think this also discusses the needs for the commissioners in the city to execute the necessary agreements and transfer the property and this says that the commissioners are going to work with the city on that clearly that's what the draft interlocal is so that's really all this this says this says we're going to create a cib um, and we're we want it to do these things which is essentially manage the convention center expansion and then ultimately manage the entire uh, convention center program in the community and then that and it reflects on the city and the county are going to have to have to get together to you know because this document alone doesn't fund anything it doesn't it doesn't give any assets to anything and that's kind of what that other other part of the documents do just just to clarify um the last section mentions that we uh, commit to uh, providing necessary real estate property as requested by the CIV. Um, I'm assuming that the city's version says the same thing. There isn't a city version of this document. This is a county commissioner. No, I'm sorry. Of the inner of what's being prepared for the interlocal. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of where we are today. Okay. We're not talking about the interlocal today, but but in the interlocal, that's the kind of thing that's going to be in there. Yeah, yeah. The, the, basically, what the interlocal is going, the draft, and we're waiting to to hear back of the city's administration comments to the draft that was worked through with a member of the county council, a member of the city council, and a, a member of the board of commissioners. 
included language that the CIB would make recommendations to whoever owns whatever property this and say, hey, this is the property we need. Mm -hmm. And then and then that group would then turn that over and unless it's just bizarre, right? <laughs> essentially. essentially. And, and so when we we met and talked with, about the interlocal with the, the city council, I think everybody at the county side expects the, the property that currently has Napa to be included in that mm -hmm. um, and the current convention center mm -hmm. to be in that. And then there's, you know, do they need the part of the lot west of the B line? No, no, I think from the county's perspective, I think everybody anticipates the, mm -hmm. The lot north across the, I guess it's, it's Third Street. Third Street. Mm -hmm. uh, that the city owns will will be part of the expanded center in one form or another. You know where the hotel goes, where right. the, the you know we we've talked about that, and that's what was all included in the. I guess it was 2018, 2019 review and and all that. So I, I think the expectation is that's what they need. And they may need a little bit more, but, but we were, don't really know at this point. Mm -hmm. So the interlocal, which is not what this is, right, right, says, right. hey, the I'm CID needs to let people know what they need and in terms of that. And I think there's commitments to that the city will use their in, or food and beverage tax and the county will right. continue to utilize its innkeepers tax in a similar right. manner. Um, unless something changes, just try. I mean, it, it's hard because I, I'm looking at the convention center manager and the Visit Bloomington uh, director together, and you know their roles have always been somewhat intertwined. I think as we move forward with with this combination, I think early on we discussed move Visit Bloomington into the new convention center, and so I. I, I I hate for us to get too tied down into our current roles that we don't allow for the natural evolution of what their work does, right? I, I think that's important and I think it's going to happen. And so some of these percentage of innkeepers tax here or there, I, I think it's yeah. great to have that premise and say, we're gonna continue to do that. But I think five years down the road, if it doesn't make sense, I think the CIB should be able to say, hey, this doesn't make sense anymore. Can we, can we change that perspective? So just to follow up on that, um, I haven't I haven't seen the interlocal and I and I know that's not on today's agenda, but I'm curious about it. So I'm going to ask and I'm sure there are others who are probably curious if you don't mind. Um, so the goal with the interlocal is to provide some guidance, but not too much guidance, because it is really up to the CIB to really steer the ship. Right. So. So that's the that's the balance that that's being sought in creating that interlocal. Well, I think when 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 the commissioners approved the CIB last fall, it was contingent upon the mayor and the city council also. Approved. Well, the city council approved a resolution and and had an I think it was Exhibit A to it. Yeah, that was based a lot on things they were hearing from the city administration about concerns, right? And so what the interlocal tried to do is, let's look at these concerns, let's put them in an interlocal so everybody knows how they would be resolved under this new. There's some things we agreed with, some things we didn't. Um, I, I think there's some things we agree and we don't agree with even to this day, right? I mean, the perfect example is how the CDC appointments, the two council appointments. I, there's I don't, I don't think there's anybody at the county that has a 100% comfort level to say, this is a great idea, let's, let, let's do it. But, I, but we also understand the city's perspective of, hey, you know, we're putting a lot of money into this, you're putting a lot of money into this, and, and the balance in the CIB ordinance, we're feeling a little, a little un, unsure about that. And it, so you, you kind of understand where they're coming from it's just a state goes to something. And so we're trying to figure out ways that we do not counteract the state code, but still gives that kind of uh, partnership feeling at the end of the day. Because I think the, the, the county has always wanted this to be a 50-50 partnership or right. equal representation. 50-50 is always tough because yeah. sometimes, they, sometimes you guys need 51, sometimes they need 51, right? right? It's, it's just how it works. Um, so I think that's kind of what the what the interlocal 
is supposed to do. It's supposed to address the concerns that the city had when we put forward the, the CIB last fall. I think it does a pretty good job in a pretty, in a fairly neutral way hmm. so that it really does try to create that kind of natural 50-50 balance. We, we both have to work together yeah. while still giving the ultimate authority and decision makers to a, an appointed board who, when it gets filled, should be people who are really interested and really have a lot of great ideas and a lot of knowledge and background on how these things should work. Yeah. So it, it, at the end of the day, they're, they're, it does contemplate a lot of deference to that group on decision making. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. I guess, I guess I'm just, I'm, I am moving ahead beyond this because uh, this is a very simple document. It, it's, it's really echoing what we've done before. It, 501c3 is not the way to go. It lacks transparency. It lacks access to budgets and information, financial information. Public meetings aren't required. I mean, you can write in all you want, but if, if you have to hire a lawyer to, to enforce it, it's not worthwhile. Um, but so I'm glad to see that. I, I love the idea of, you know, um, three appointments, three appointments, and those six people pick the seventh. Great. Um, I've, I've, I've been a skeptic uh, in a lot of ways about economic impacts um, when there are um, few local restaurants under different ownership, when um, there are some businesses that will do well, which is great. I'm happy to see that. I just don't know that um, a lot of service jobs is really the positive economic impact we want. Um, because really it's going to be in hotels and restaurants that are going to see the biggest impact. I have nothing against hotels and restaurants, but those are not the kind of wages and the kinds of jobs that I think we really want to attract. However, we're going to do it. Um, the majority has spoken, fine. Let's do it right, and so I support it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything that Commissioner Thomas said. I do want to see just some slight changes to uh, Section 2 because um, currently it says that um, the mayor shall appoint two members to the CIB. The appointments must be from different political parties. I'd like that to read, shall be shall not be from the same political party. Right. And then there's nothing in that section that indicates that no more than four of the appointees can be from the same party, at least the way but I read it, it. But if you do it this way where they have to be different political parties, different political parties, one appointment, one appointment. That's only two that, out of the five. What, seven. what if one of the, out of the seven of the councils decide to? Out of the seven. So. What I'm you saying can, is that there's no way, the way it's currently written, to ensure that that seventh per, it's the seventh person that's the issue. It could be, potentially, potentially, yeah. 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 Because so the we way it's to, written, this out of the six, there's no way you could have more than four out of one party. Right, but but it's but it's, but there's the nothing incorporation in. of the seventh. So, so so a statement in there that reflects that the seventh would have to meet the political party requirements of state code. I, right, there I you go. It. Right. I mean, currently, I would, it's not in yeah. there. And I would just reference state code too, right? Instead of writing it all out. I mean, you want to write some of it out, yeah. but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, we yeah. do that in planning a lot now, which makes so much more sense because code changes. Code changes. And you want to have to go back and yeah. clear it through your yeah. um, code yourself. I, I see your point. Yeah. Because I was like, well, there's no way there can be more than four. But yeah, the seventh person is. Yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, I do feel some time pressure on getting this done as well because yeah. we do have to have things reported into the state. In fact, I heard from somebody in Indianapolis yesterday who went no Monday who wanted to know where things yeah. stood. So um, they're they're um, not forgetting what what's going on down here. Is I don't think it should be included in the CIB document here, but I just want to say that I would hope that all of the appointing bodies will consider diversity in terms of race, income, geographic residence uh, within the county, et cetera, as they're making these appointments. Yes, we need people who are experienced, but I think 
we also want to try to get as diverse a group as we can, representing a lot of different aspects of what diversity means. Um, but I don't think that's anything we should write in here. I just wanted to say it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Would it be inappropriate to invite uh, Talisha Kopik and Mike McAfee up to make a few comments to us? Especially since they've put so much time into this. <laughs> Come on up, yeah. And I do appreciate you both being here. Oh, hi. Well, uh, my name is Talisha Kopik, and with Downtown Bloomington, Inc., and we certainly appreciate uh, all the work and diligence that you all have put into this over several years to, like, help get this right. Um, I was just thinking this is the 100th anniversary of that building at 302 South College Avenue. Wow. It's held up dramatically. It's been great for a meeting and event facility. It's still very sturdy, has good bones. And so, um, you know, there's something kind of surreal of like, okay, yeah, it's kind of time for this next step for it and take it into the next hundred years, uh, which is kind of hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, convention business has certainly come back strong after the pandemic we've got several new groups that are coming and they you know range from mental health groups nutrition school nutrition we're having a lot of those conferences this summer um, and uh, there's a native plant society coming there's uh, just some real interesting new groups that are coming and so i know that's important as we look uh, forward and um, just appreciate all the work that you're putting into this and it's been wonderful working for Monroe County over all of these years. So, um, so thank you very much. The, the, the plant group is an invasive plant, an invasive plant species group. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Mike McAfee from Visit Bloomington. And again, I just want to echo what Talisha said and thank you for um, all the work you've been doing on this and particularly the, the, the forward movement over the last few weeks. I really appreciate that. Um, I just want to say, um, I, we talked, I know Penny's, Penny knows about this, but we um, are very excited uh, next July of 2024, we'll be hosting the Indiana Society of Association Executives, their annual conference here for three days. There'll be 150 statewide meeting planners here. We'll get to showcase Monroe County and Bloomington to them. And I think it would be, um, I, I really hope by, by July of next year, we'll have something to show that, you know, at least a, some something on paper to tell them about the showcase to them. So that's really what I'm gonna be working towards. We're going down to that, that um, conference is in Evansville this summer and Visit Bloomington will be going down there and hosting a dinner and a preview to 2024. But uh, that's gonna be my goal is to have something really cool to show them uh, next July. Thank you again. Awesome. I, I, I know when we first started this, um, I was a skeptic about whether or not business would bounce back um, following the pandemic because we've all gotten so accustomed to kind of the virtual world at this mm -hmm. point. Um, but in going to the DBI meetings and, and conversations with Talisha, business is back, definitely. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I've seen is that, and I, this is part of my own education that I've needed, is that these kinds of, of folks that come in, they're filling our restaurants and uh, our hotels during the week, mm -hmm. which is not when we generally have mm -hmm. other types of tourism come through. Right. And so I think that's part of the real boon to our economy is that it's, it's maximizing mm -hmm. some of the, the things that we have here. And so, um, I have, I have evolved from being a skeptic to being a supporter. I'll put it that way. <laughs> I'd have to say that's been my evolution, also. So, um, can we'll, we get it on our agenda next week? That's my question. That's, I was just about to say All the right. same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, finally, public input, right? <laughs> it is such a simple document, uh, so. But yeah. it, it has so much weight to it, so yeah. yeah, I look forward to getting this done.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you both very much. And now we have uh, Jennifer Pearl from the BEDC here to present issues. I'm getting hungry too. <laughs> Morning. Hi. It's great to see you here today. Thank you so much. Um, and we have a PowerPoint. And thank you so much to Tech Services for that. I very much appreciate it. I'm also just going to watch my time here because we don't want to keep you here all day. <laughs> as much as we all love talking about economic development. Um, all right. Well, so thank Would you. Would you put the mic down closer to you, Ms. Thank you. For short people. If this, well, no, it, the, the acoustics in here are not great. So. I even wore heels today for this podium, so I, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to present to you the commissioners today about the ongoing support that the commissioners offer uh, that's been appropriated by County Council um, that is a part of the BEDC's budget. Um, this opportunity is to present on our work, benefits to the county, and future directions. Um, I believe each of you has a, bound, a spiral bound notebook in front of you uh, with the full detailed report that we delivered in January, um, and I will be speaking more broadly about it today. Um, before I move forward, just wanted to double check if there was any specific questions that you have, or if we'll hold those to the end. We'll wait to see what, what you have to tell us. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. Um, so, moving to the next slide, if that's how this works. Okay, so the BEDC, we are a nonprofit um, that, was, is, that serves all of Monroe County, um, and we advance the creation, attraction, and retention of quality jobs. On the next slide, you can see um, the work that we do advances economic development strategy for the community, which I think is the next slide as well as supporting employment growth and attraction. I don't think they're hearing you there. Oh, thank you so much. Should I just keep saying next? Is that, that yep. best? Great. Okay. All right, next. Um, BEDC leadership. Um, you'll see some photos on the screen that pop up here. Um, and we would like to thank uh, Commissioner Githens as well as County Council Member Jeff McKim, uh, who serve on our executive committee. We meet monthly. Um, the executive committee and our officers guide the work of the BEDC um, throughout the year. Next, um, what is economic development? At, at heart, it fosters conditions for prosperity. Decades ago, the way economic development was practiced was you had land and a company, you put them together, and voila, you have jobs and investment. It is not so simple anymore. Um, employers, just like our neighbors across the community, have increasingly focused on quality of life needs such as housing, child care, workforce development, diversity needs, and more. Next. So the BEDC's areas of focus are on traded sector companies in addition to economic development strategy. Our business retention, expansion, and attraction projects support the growth of traded sector companies and the jobs that they offer. The traded sector are companies that sell goods and services outside of the region to bring income into the region, which is then circulated amongst our local companies. Think of Cook, Oliver, Catalan, Tassas, and others. Um, you may be asking, why do we grow existing employers and attract new ones when we know that our unemployment rates are so low? Economies change over time, and as much as we all wish we could, we're not able to control the global economy. We know that we used to produce 60% of the furniture in North America here, then it was RCA and Otis and others, but economies change. We've had the rise of life sciences, and now we're seeing the rise of tech. Um, so there's a need for fostering what's next while taking care of our current employers. Next. Um, <laughs> economic development also works on a long timeline. A great example of this is the Bloomington Rehabilitation Hospital at 46 and Curry. It was two years from when the BEDC started work with them to when they opened their doors. And that, continue, that work has um, continued forward. They've actually over-delivered on their hiring promises. There's currently around 140 staff. So we work on a long time horizon. Next. Um, the BDC funding breakdown. Uh, this is just to give you a peek into how we operate. 
Um, around 70% of our um, budgeted revenue for 2023 comes from memberships. Uh, there are two memberships, uh, one from county commissioners, one from council. Um, most of our members are private sector, but all three of our local governments are included, as well as IU, Ivy Tech, nonprofits, K-12, and others. Um, around 18% of our budget comes from sponsorships and grants, and around 12% of our budget comes from government appropriations on top of membership. So including the MOU that we're discussing today from the county, as well as a similar appropriation from the city. Um, of the county contributions, because you have two memberships and the um, appropriation we're discussing today, that accounts for around 7% of the BEDC's budgeted revenue for 2023. Next. So you may be asking, how does that compare to our sibling organizations around the state? Um, a recent survey showed that a bit over 60% of respondents reported receiving county funding for greater than 10% of their budget. So we're really appreciative of um, the county's investments in, um, in economic development for the community uh, and just grateful for the investments you make alongside other counties. Next, what does Monroe County government and what do residents gain from the BEDC? Um, this falls into a few different categories. The first I want to talk about is um, the projects that are supported by the BEDC and how that leads to capital expenditures in the community. So capital expenditures are land, investments, and other improvements that companies make. From 2021 to 2022, there was a combined $612 million in capital expenditures from the companies that you see on the screen that we worked very closely with. So Baxter, the Bloomington Rehab Hospital, Catalan, Phoenix, Oliver, and Prevelli. Um, that's around two thirds of a billion dollars. Um, Monroe County government does not have an economic development department. So the BEDC provides services that might otherwise be done in house. I wanna give a big shout out to Jeff Cockrell because we work closely with him on projects. He just recently um, referred a project to us last week that we've been working on together. Um, so we help them find land and buildings, guide companies through the tax abatement process, introduce them to the correct county departments, like planning and engineering, and help to serve in many ways as an ombudsman as they're expanding locally. Um, so that's all well and good, but what does that actually do for taxpayers here? So there's a few different benefits to government and taxpayers from capital expenditures. One is that CapEx stimulates the economy. By expanding output at our local companies, it enables them to ramp up and create additional direct jobs as well as indirect jobs at the many different partners they work at, with across the community. Second, capital expenditures um, that increase actually to help keep property taxes lower. The reason why is because tax rates are calculated with the overall tax levy divided by the assessed value. So raising assessed value among our employers lowers tax rates overall. Third, increases in wages feed into local income tax revenue and it also supports consumer spending in our local economy. Uh, according to IU's IBRC, um, average wages in the, the sectors that we target at the BEDC resulted in an average of uh, $18,000 in wage increases from 2017 to 2021. Uh, we also saw local wages rise during Catalan's push to hire starting at $19 an hour and despite their recent layoffs, our average wages have stayed up from that bump that we saw in our local market. And finally, capital expenditures enable our community to keep pace with technology and infrastructure improvements. A great example of this is Cook Pharmaca's past investment in what became the Catalan site. When they took over that site in 2018, there were around 750 employees. They're now around 2,500 employees today. By having that investment in the building and in the technology that was there, we were able to grow that for the future of the economy, even though the building changed hands. Next. So beyond capital expenditures, what are other benefits to the county and residents? Um, one is the strategic focus that the BEDC brings to economic development. We focus on the industries that you see here, include advanced manufacturing, life sciences, technology, creative arts, and energy. And the reason why we focus on these industries is because they build on our existing companies, 
our existing strengths in the community, and there's a track record for wages and job growth uh, in these industries. I already mentioned wages. Um, during 2017 to 2021, in these industries, we saw a growth of around 1,100 jobs. The BEDC screens projects that come in uh, for best fit for our community. And we do our best to avoid any um, projects that may have a negative impact in some way, such as on the environment or otherwise. Um, the BEDC worked on 2020, sorry, 22 active business retention expansion and attraction projects last year. So it was a very robust year for what we were seeing coming in the door. Next, we also bring a strategic approach to land use. While we have around 900 acres to develop for future employment growth in Monroe County, we currently lack around 400,000 square feet of space just for our current employers. And that's just to retain those that we currently have here. So moving forward, what we are really aiming to do is to work with our partners to update infrastructure on the sites that are available, zoning, and do any other site preparation that we can with utilities and others to make sure that we can accommodate, our, especially our existing companies, when they have growth needs. We've also seen some wonderful opportunities at the Monroe County Airport. Um, in 2022, we facilitated meetings between airport leadership and um, subject matter experts to provide information on best practices for developing airport property which can help develop and strengthen the long-term economic sustainability for the airport. We continue to um, promote airport properties in our materials. And in 2023, we got even more strategic. Uh, this included submitting the uh, airport property as a potential site for clean aviation uh, for a business attraction project this year. This was part of a national search and we were one of three finalists, which was a really big deal for our community. While another site ultimately won out, we actually consider this a win because we were able to work with Carlos and airport leadership on ways to strategically support the airport, capital investments, and employment growth. This positions us for future opportunities because we often have a quick turnaround on those, and it put the site on the, on the radar of site selectors for future projects. Next. So moving along to, you know, beyond business retention, expansion, and attraction, what about strategy? Because as I mentioned, it's not as simple as it used to be. Communities really thrive when they have shared vision, they lean into what makes them great, and they coordinate investments in those areas. We've seen that, you know, a great example would be, you know, Nashville, Tennessee. Everybody knows it's Music City. That, that's not always something that they coordinated in the past. That was a decision of leadership and investments that they made. Similarly, we have an opportunity to lean into what makes us strong here to position ourselves for a strong future. We know that we're a hub on the innovation corridor from Indy to Crane. We have national and state investments through the US Chips and Science Act, infrastructure funds, Ready 2.0 from the state, and the IU 2030 strategic plan is launched which will impact communities around the state. If we do this right, we have a once in a generation opportunity to launch ourselves into a strong future but it means having a vision and preparing ourselves in order to respond to those opportunities. So what is that vision and where do we need to invest as a community? The Economic Vitality Project has been our response to these community needs. Um, and a huge thanks goes again to Commissioner Gibbons and to um, Council Member McKim, who have been very active members on our steering committee for this project. Our goal is to ensure that Monroe County becomes the best community for employers, innovators, individuals, and families, that we have a strong future. As a community-wide strategy, the EVP is much larger than the BEDC. It's about collective action across our sectors. It frames the community net investments that are needed and why, and it can help public, private, and nonprofit leaders focus resources and investments. It also identifies lead partners to implement various aspects of the plan to make sure we're all supporting one another. Okay, so what, what goes into that plan? On the next slide, you can see the three areas um, of need and focus that the steering committee has been considering. Uh, economic vitality, quality of place, and quality of life. Under economic vitality, um, we see opportunities for us to be better leveraging our innovation assets for future technology growth, we see opportunities for job and wage growth in the community. Our wages in this community actually lag 
the statewide average and other communities around the state. So Bloomington is around 25.73 per hour, but the statewide average is just shy of $29 an hour, whereas a city like Ann Arbor is north of $32 an hour. By attracting quality jobs and fostering really great future opportunities, that is an opportunity we have to grab. Um, we'd like to see local poverty rates go down as well. And the better that we can um, become in connecting workforce to the opportunities that are there, um, that is another opportunity that we see before us. Um, we need to prepare our future labor force, um, particularly to address challenges of our aging labor force. We know that we have over 120,000 individuals over age 16 in Monroe County. But of those 120,000 individuals, 22% are over age 60. Um, this is higher than some of the national averages that I've seen, and we know that we need to prepare ourselves for the future. Um, beyond economic vitality, I think you'd be very familiar with the other buckets that we see here. Quality of place, we all know that non-student housing is needed across the community. There's opportunities for strengthening public safety and community beautification. And then under quality of life, needs for child care staffing, health care, mental health care staffing, support for unhoused in our community, uh, as well as advancing uh, in diversity in our community as we do lag other peer cities. There are many different organizations leading quality of place and quality of life needs, so we're partnering with them through the EVP as different partners will spearhead different parts of the plan. We know that these things are not only important for our neighbors around the community, but also for our employers, because these are things that we get asked about by our existing and prospective future employers. Um, our next steps are to grow the coalition of leaders and organizations that are a part of this um, to help implement these plans together. Um, and the BEDC will be advancing efforts under the economic vitality bucket. Next. So moving uh, into 2023 and beyond, what's in it for the county? Uh, we've already talked about the EVP, business retention expansion, tech cluster. Um, moving on to the next slide, I can talk a bit more about life sciences. We know that we have around 9,000 people who work in life sciences in our community. We've launched workforce tours um, with Baxter, which have already borne fruit with IU, uh, an IU hire recently. We're supporting them on their acquisition. And we're here to support companies even during downturns. When Cook and Catalan um, announced their layoffs, we reached out to both of them to connect them with community resources. And we also provided lists of local employers that are hiring so that the individuals that were affected can land in our community and be retained here. We know that there's a few hundred jobs open um, and we continue to update those lists. Next, other benefits to the county are um, promotion of the community through our video series, which is on YouTube, next. And then also um, through our newsletters and social media, uh, we are constantly putting out information on Monroe County government offerings uh, and others. Believe it or not, our um, government calendar is actually our most popular newsletter. Um, so I, I guess you know we're, people really want to come and see all of these meetings. So um, we try to get the word out of, about everything that you're doing. Um, next, so a summary of benefits is really a strategic approach to economic development across the community, um, to business retention, expansion, and attraction, and land use. Um, our capital expenditures from our projects stimulate the economy. They help keep property taxes lower for everyone, increase wages, and enable our community to keep pace with tech advancements. And overall, we're able to provide services for Monroe County government um, in lieu of having a department in that area. Um, county funding has contributed to the base budget for the BEDC in 2022, and that is also the plan for 2023. A lot of these projects have been a very heavy lift for our small team, so your partnership and your support have been very significant. Um, we're very delighted to continue working with you and appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you a lot. <laughs> um, oops. Thank you, that was a lot. Sorry, I gotta remember the mic. Uh, questions or comments from well, No, I think I need some time to digest all of this. So basically, the, what is before us is uh, signing the MOU with the BEDC to, uh, for the additional $30,000. And um, 
you referenced the fact that last year the Monroe County uh, provided thir it was thirty thousand dollars to BDC. Mm -hmm. So, um, and thank you for that. Yeah. What what specifically did do you feel like that the residents of Monroe County benefited? What benefit did they gain from that thirty thousand dollars that would then also perhaps carry into this this funding cycle? Yeah, so I'd say the last slide with the summary of benefits is really kind of a breakdown of that. Um, in addition to providing those services um, for Monroe County government, um, in other um, local governments, they may have like a designated person or department um, that does many of the activities we talked about. Um, and the partnership that we have with the county is to provide many of those services. Commissioner Thomas, do you have questions, um, comments? Yeah, we, we had a chat last week. Thank you for the um, conversation. Um, talked through some things and um, uh, you indicated that the money was already included in your budget for this year, even though we hadn't signed the contract. Um, so I, um, that's concerning to me, honestly. Um, I, I, can understand how it happens, but um, that's just, uh, it's a little worrying for me because I uh, don't want to leave you short, but I also don't think it's fair to paint us in the corner either. So, um, but that's specifically what we're looking at for next, whenever this goes on our agenda, correct? Yes. Is that MOU? Yes. Okay. That and the, I'll point out that the county council has already approved those mm -hmm. funds. But when when we did the MOU last year, if my memory serves correctly, we said we we wanted it broken out into two separate years because we wanted to know what that benefit was going mm -hmm. to be to doing this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess too, um, I I understand the the need for the money. That's that's not the issue uh, completely for me. But I but I think that people often forget the interaction that goes on as well, that when we talk about quality of life, well, we look at, and you talked about beautification specifically and parks and things like that. That's part of what government, at least Monroe County provides. We also provide support for some of the diversity you talked about with mm -hmm. the funding that we provide to Stonebelt and to um, life designs. When we talk about mental health, we provide funding to Centerstone and to HealthNet. So I think that, that we do some of those things that enhance your job as well. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing when we talk about recently, there's been a big cry about affordable housing within our, our community. And government is being asked repeatedly now to help with that in different ways. And so we are considering what we can do using some of the ARPA funds. So I think that, that while I understand the outreach part that you do. I think some of the things that we do also need to be acknowledged because it makes what you're selling yeah. <laughs> easier in some ways. Yeah, and if I may, I, we 100% agree with that. Um, the purpose of the EBP is never to duplicate anything that is already happening. It's rather to help amplify. Um, and actually at our steering committee meeting tomorrow, we will be discussing um, current initiatives that are work being worked on in those areas so that we can make sure they're getting supported, called out, and if additional community resources are needed from the private sector, from grants, et cetera, we can kind of try to amplify the message and say, hey, let's all point in the same direction on those items. Um, and also, if I may, to address the um, process question that you had as well. Um, so we worked with um, council, the appropriation, I believe, was approved in fall. Um, and then it was discussed as a part of our budget um, with executive committee and others at the end of the year. Um, and so that's how it ended up in our plan for this year. If there's something that we should adjust in our process, um, you know, if this comes up again for 2024, we'd be happy to talk about that. Thank you, no, I, thank you. Mm -hmm. So when will this be back on our regular agenda? Or when will it be not back on our regular agenda, but on our regular agenda? Mr. Um, Cockrell? I, we could put it on next week. Is that? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, we'll, Thank you. 
we'll address this next week then. Thank and you. we won't make you do the whole presentation again next week. We're not going to put anybody <laughs> through that. Is there? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't fine. know. It's fine. I geek out about economic development, but I know that it's been a long day, so I really appreciate your time. Um, are there any um, questions or anything you'd like me to bring next week that would be useful? Uh, um, yeah, it, it has been a long day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <I'll say> <laughs> I kind of well, um, in looking through your materials, you you gathered a great deal of information in one form or another. Um, I would like to hear something about what happens with that information. Oh. Yes, actually. But not necessarily right now, okay. <laughs> maybe next week. <laughs> Short answer, it's posted on our website and reported regularly. <laughs> well, I, I, I do, I wanted, I, I do want to give you some credit, too, that, that um, as we've been looking at some of the child care needs, I've, I've been reciting some of the information I've learned through the yeah. EVP process about the fact that we, we could double the number of child care places that we have available to meet that's what we need to meet the need probably locally. And Absolutely. so that's driving some of the decisions that we're making too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Th thank you. I know it's it's hard to go last, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks okay. for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> you get the warm seat award. <laughs> Is that opposed to the hot seat? <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> And uh, I, do we have any other items? <laughs> <laughs> you better not. That was that look. Do you have anything? You better not. <laughs> Don't I have a switch for her chair or something, you know? <laughs> okay, well, with that, um, we'll, call the, we'll adjourn this meeting and we will see you next week. Thank you all. <laughs>